Good afternoon to all of our participants on the East Coast. A good morning to those in the Central and Pacific time zones. Today, we have two fascinating guests. First and foremost, we have Hillel Fold. Many of you may be familiar because either through, through X, through Facebook, through other social media, this is a man who over the course of the last couple of months has had over a half a billion impressions, okay? He really is a, a one-man show, a fascinating person who together with his family made Aliyah, a leadership family in American Jewry, and he actually has given up his technology business and has been focused on Israel advocacy and communicating what's happening, the real story of what's happening in Israel to the Anglo world. And we're going to have a chance to hear from Hillel, to hear a lot about who he's speaking to, the feedback he's getting. And of course, we're going to be having an update from Major General Nadav Padan. Major General Nadav Padan will be sharing with us some insights. And this has been a very, very challenging time for Israel and for the IDF, because the worst day of the, of the land war happened when we lost 22 soldiers, 22 soldiers. He'll be talking about Kanyunis, about Rafah. He'll be talking about a number of issues with us in the second part of the program. At this point, we'd like to hand it to our special guest. We want to hand it over to him, Hillel Fult. And Hillel, please share with us about yourself, your background, and, and really give us, us this group, group of listeners, listeners and participants an insight into the world that you're living in and who you're engaging. Sure. Thank you for having me. This is an incredible opportunity. I've been a big fan of your work for a long time, and I know that uh, the IDF and the state of Israel and the Jewish people appreciate everything that you're doing. So just keep doing what you're doing. That's first of all. Um, as far as me, I'm uh, I'm from New York, as you mentioned. Grew up there. Moved to Israel 30 years ago with my family. Um, you know, back then Israel was not what it is today. Back then, you couldn't get deodorant in Israel. You couldn't buy tuna fish, right? It was like a, it was it was basically a third world country. And I came here, you know, as a hardcore Zionist, a word that has since been you know, turned into a dirty word today, but, uh, you know, proud Zionist here. Uh, and so I, I came here 30 years ago and, you know, went through high school and, and went to the army. I was in uh, artillery in the army. Uh, then I studied political science. And basically, after I finished my degree, I kind of didn't know exactly how I was going to get to my northern star, which was always technology. Uh, but I'm not an engineer and I didn't really know the vehicle to get there. Uh, I found myself writing user guides for a tech company, literally writing user guides for AT&T and Verizon, um, which, as you can imagine, is not a an optimal career choice for someone with ADHD like myself. Uh, and so pretty quickly, I got pretty bored. And I started what we call today blogging. At the time, I was writing on the internet. I didn't call it that. And I sure did not have a business model. Uh, but really quickly, entrepreneurs started to reach out and I'd meet them. And you know, I basically created this very strange career of just a guy who loves tech and I get to work with you know some of the most fascinating people I very strongly felt like I was a kid in a candy store uh so I worked with you know with startups I worked with Google and Oracle and Microsoft and some of the bigger ones um and I write for basically every leading tech publication uh in the world and you know I, I got a, a very I would say unique perspective on this this thing that we call startup nation um because again I wear several different hats so I would meet, you know, on a daily basis, a marathon of meetings with Israeli startups and many of the startups that you are all familiar with that are now big companies, I really met, you know, when, when it was an idea. Um, and so, you know, my career was a was a dream come true, really. And, and, and beyond my career, I feel like living in Israel now is not what it used to be. It's paradise. I mean, we're, you know, I wake up every morning and I feel like, how is this my life? And I feel very blessed. Uh, I live in Beit Shemesh, the town in between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. I have five beautiful kids, amazing wife. Uh, amazing family. My parents, as you mentioned, uh, were leaders in in Jewish education uh, world in the United States. They moved here. They live in the German colony in Jerusalem, and really just dream, living the dream. Until about five and a half years ago, and my uh, older brother Ari Fold was shopping for his family uh, the day before Yom Kippur, and a sixteen year old Palestinian kid stabbed him in the main artery in his neck. Uh, at which point, Ari was medically dead. Uh, and somehow, miraculously, he ran after the terrorist, jumped over a wall, and when the terrorist is inches away from his next victim, a nice lady named Hila, who had given the terrorist a falafel a few minutes before, she obviously didn't know he was a terrorist, she had a falafel stand, and he was going after her, and Ari shot him inches away from her, and she has since become a, a member of the Fold family, but Ari, unfortunately, uh, you know, died, um, and he has since become a national hero of the state of Israel because of, of the fact that he saved someone's life in his last breath. Um, and so that was obviously a very traumatic experience and something, you know, as an American family, we never imagined we would ever have to cope with. We were thrown into the, the club that no one wants to be a part of. Um, and, you know, the stories of Ari's legacy 
are unbelievable. Really, he managed to impact millions and millions of lives in his short life. Uh, and, you know, that's a lesson that he taught me and many other people. And he also taught me that Israel is is worth fighting for. And he fought for Israel around the clock. Um, and so October 7th, um, you know, I was in I was in synagogue like everyone and I didn't have my phone on me and the rumors started to circulate and the kids started to get called up. You know, when I say kids, I mean, 18 year old kids in the neighborhood, they're kids they started to get called up and we knew something was was bad. Now, as a as a person who lost someone, a loved you know a loved one to terror, unfortunately, terrorist attacks you know trigger me badly, uh, and you know that's that's in general. But when this was going on, I was you know I was having a I was pretty pretty much a panic attack, and you know everyone was trying to calm me down for some strange reason. I don't know where this number came from, but when everyone was saying to be calm down, it'll be okay. I was like, what happens if I come back from the holiday and turn on my phone and there are seventy five dead Israelis? I don't know where that number came from. That was like the far, my brain could not fathom you know 75 was like the craziest my brain would imagine uh and we know the rest obviously and then really without making any declarations or announcements i just shut down my business immediately fired all my clients uh and i just jumped in and i i very strongly feel like everything i've done till today has brought me to this point uh and i and i feel that i'm channeling ari on a daily on, a, on an hourly on a, on a minutely basis um and I, I you know the the way i view my mission uh, is very specific. So anything that's outside of this mission, I decline, even if it's something important, fundraisers and things like that, you know, I, I'm focused on my mission. And my mission is as follows. Uh, the first part is fighting misinformation, but not just fighting misinformation like many people do. I focus on providing real-time accurate information, which those two things are generally mutually exclusive. Because if it's real-time, then you have no way to verify it. And if it's accurate, then it takes time to verify I am focused on cross-referencing every piece of information that I get, whether it's from the IDF, whether it's from the government, whether it's from 50 other channels. Um, and I'm very careful of what I share, but I'm also very careful to share it in real time. So for example, uh, the hospital story, uh, I tweeted you know, a half an hour before anyone even knew about the hospital that I said, heads up, you're about to hear about a hospital being bombed. You're going to be told it was the IDF. It was not the IDF. And that tweet got millions of views. So by the time the propaganda machine kicked into you know, high gear and everyone was being told it was Israel, those millions of people who heard, who read my tweet knew that it was propaganda, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's impact. And so I'm very focused on real-time information that's accurate. That's part one of my mission. Part two of my mission is, is our group is providing hope and optimism and, and, and good news. You know, whenever it, whenever there's a lot of, you know, we're all, we're all devastated. We're all in mourning, but there's a lot of amazing, beautiful things happening. And so, you know, I'm very strongly focused on, on, on raising spirits. And I want to share with you something that I heard recently from a rabbi that really strongly resonated with me. It's a beautiful thought. Um, you know, when when uh, in, in the portion, the Torah portion of Lech Lecha, when God says to Abraham, leave your hometown and go to the strange country that's called Canaan, which is obviously the land of Israel. He says these four words to him that as a person who grew up religious, I, I learned these words thousands of times and I never thought about them till recently. And this is this is what this rabbi from Boca Raton uh, from Goldberg said, and I think it is unbelievably accurate and beautiful. He said, God says to Abraham, those who bless you, Abraham, those who stand in your corner will be blessed. Those who curse you, aor, right? I'll curse them. Now, if you if you, you don't have to be a, an English teacher, a, gram a grammar teacher to understand that there's a lack of parallel here. It says, it's the same root of bracha, of blessing. Those who bless you will be blessed. Umekalelcha, those who curse you, it should have just said, Akalel, I will curse. The same word, but it doesn't. It changes words to Aor. Aor also means I'll curse, but why does it switch language? So Rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg said, because the word Aor has a different word in it, or light. And he said, this is the way to read that, that portion. It's those who stand in your corner will be blessed. Those who bless the Jewish people will be blessed. Those who curse you, those who get in your face, in your way, they'll see your light, they'll see your unity. They'll see your charity. They'll see the FIDF. They'll see the unbelievable initiatives that are happening around the world to support our nation in this hard time. To me, that really summed it up. They bring darkness, we bring light. It's really as simple as that. And so I'm, you know, I'm basically fighting this fight all day, every day. Um, you know, I, I've done something in the war that I've never done before, which is I, I now cannot read the replies that I get to my tweets. So I always would engage everyone. And Ari, my late brother, always engaged everyone. That was as part of his kind of philosophy, always, always engage, uh, which is something I always did. But the volume that I'm dealing with has become completely impossible to manage. And, you know, the way I see it, I mean, 
there are three groups. This is the way I categorize the internet. There are three groups. There's our group, meaning the pro-Israel. We don't we don't need convincing, but we do need strengthening. We do need reinforcement. We do need ammunition in terms of the facts and the ability to answer questions. We need that. Then there's the third group, which is the people that I sadly have to write off because they're the coming at me with, you know, pictures of my dead brother and his kids with fire coming out of them and calling Hitler and, you know, people that I, I can't engage with because they just they're not with me on this on the same plane but then there's the majority and i think it's a ve- by far the majority which is the middle group it's the group of people that aren't necessarily pro-israel but they have integrity they're willing to listen they're willing to hear they're willing to be convinced and so those are the people that as far as i'm concerned are my target audience and you know the the response has been absolutely incredible i'm getting hundreds sometimes thousands of messages a day telling me I simply did not know that that's what Zionism was. I literally, I, I wrote a, a pretty long tweet about Zionism, but in a factual way, no, no opinions, no politics, just what is Zionism? And I got messages from people, not one and not two, saying to me, I simply did not know. I, I thought Zionism was racism. I didn't know any of this. And so, you know, it, it's a very strong focus of mine to, to target those people that are willing to hear you. Um, but I'm not going to pretend that the hate that I'm getting is... You know, I, I like to say I fix skin, but after all these years on the internet, it still gets to me. I got to be honest. Um, you know, yesterday, just yesterday, it's a, it's a wild thing that happened to me yesterday. I met with someone, shall remain unnamed. You can you can go look it up. But I met with someone, and and um, we took a picture. We were in the Sheraton in Tel Aviv. We took a picture at the end of our meeting in front of the beach. It was a beautiful picture, and I posted it on X on Twitter. And uh, some anti-Semite took our picture, photoshopped us out of the picture and put us in a background of Gaza. So behind us, you see destruction of Gaza and, you know, people buried under the destruction and me and my friend smiling with a selfie. And they posted it and it got, I mean, this person has a million followers. It got hundreds, hundreds of thousands of engagements of people saying these disgusting Zionists, how could he stand there smiling in front of Gaza like that? And, you know, we reported it to Twitter. Twitter said, oh, there's nothing wrong with it because it's clearly parody. It's clearly not and I'm like, but look at the comments. This is not, no one knows this isn't real. Well, Twitter didn't take it down. And um, someone, you know, put a community note on it saying this is this is misleading and Twitter removed the community note. So I'm dealing with this every day. You know, the anti-Semitism is staggering. It's staggering to see, you know, the same blood libels, the same tropes. It's just unbelievable, really unbelievable. You know, when we say never again, we didn't, as far as I'm concerned, we didn't only need never again concentration camps. We meant never again, the level of anti-Semitism. And here we are, right? And you know, it's it's a scary thing because, you know, the, the transition from dangerous rhetoric to the extermination of Jews in Europe took years. Here it took a month, two months, and it's it's pretty scary stuff. But I do think that, you know, as a nation, the Jewish nation, we have this tendency to not see what's right in front of our eyes. Uh, you know, all the way back to the Bible in ancient Egypt, when we talk about the 10 plagues, which is this week's Torah portion, what people don't, many people don't know is that even after those 10 plagues, even after God literally said, get out of here, 80% of the Jews stayed back. 80%, only one fifth left Egypt. How could that be? Because they said, this is, I'm, I'm Egyptian. I was born here. Leave me alone in this land of milk and honey. I'm staying here. And we, we tend to not see things that are in front of our eyes. And especially when we're in it, you know, when we talk about the different holidays that we, we, we celebrate, Purim and Hanukkah and all of these things. And we, we, we celebrate, we, but we don't really think what the story was there. I mean, Purim was the near genocide of the Jewish people. And if you had told me in the time of Purim that one day I'm going to celebrate Purim, I would have said to you, you're insensitive. How could you even say such a thing? We're, we're suffering. And Hanukkah, we weren't supposed to win that war. And Passover, we were ancient Egypt, the strongest empire in the world. We brought them to their knees, but we were enslaved and persecuted for 210 years. So when you're in it, it's very hard to see. And that's true for our current situation. We're in it and we're all suffering and we're all mourning. We're all sad. But if we do take a step back, and it's hard to do. It's hard to do. And again, it, it it might even be perceived as insensitive. But for our own sanity, we have to take a step back and look at how did this this all of this fits into history. And you know, I would never, God forbid, say that God did, you know, October 7th. You know, I don't understand God's ways, but I but I am gonna say that every single time I hear about a rocket landing in an empty space, I ask myself, where are these empty spaces? Like this is a country smaller than New Jersey. Where are these empty spaces? And so from my perspective, the fact that they've fired, you know, 20,000, 30,000 rockets since, you know, the last couple of years into Israel, and we have, you know, single digit casualties, it, to me, it's like, that is, that is pretty miraculous stuff. And, and even 
even the Iron Dome, right? I mean, we talk about the Iron Dome. Yeah, okay, no problem. Just detonate rockets in the air, 95% precision, as if that's normal. Right? These are these are unbelievable things. And, you know, I'm sure maybe, you know, I don't know if, if you know Daniel Gold, who invented the Iron Dome, but he told me the story. He came up with this idea, and everyone told him it's impossible. The military told him it's impossible. The government told him you can't detonate a rocket in midair. It's impossible. And here we are. And these are these are unbelievable things. And so I, I you know, my message, I think that, I, you know, I tell myself all day, every day, and I have to because it's hard. It's really hard to look at this, you know, not through a, a human lens, because if we look at this through a human lens, you know, we'll lose our mind. I mean, none of this makes any sense. How could it be that people deny October 7th when there's HD footage of it? How could that be? On October 8th, I said to myself, you know, the silver lining here is at least the world's going to stand with us finally. There's no way the world's not going to stand with us after this. And here we are. So, you know, my message is pretty clear, and I tell this to myself, and I'm telling it to you, and that is that, you know, again, Purim and Hanukkah and all of them, uh, you know, they were they were very close to tragedy, and we celebrate them today, and I am telling you that we will win this war, Hamas will be no more, we will always remember, you know, that horrible day, we're never going to forget it, but we will dance again. Simchas Torah, the holiday on which this happened, is going to be the happiest day of the year again. We will grab and hold our Torah scrolls tighter than ever before, and we will dance again, just like we do on Purim and just like we do on Hanukkah. It is going to take some time. We're going to have to win this war. It's going to take patience. But from a person who just opens history books, just open history books. The script is already written. It happens every single time. You know, and I would say that, you know, I don't think, God forbid, I wouldn't even imply that there's going to be concentration camps in, you know, 2024 in, in the United States or anywhere else. That's not going to happen. But you know, things are getting pretty bad pretty fast. And I would say that really, you know, as we say, never again is happening. There's only one difference. And the difference is LL.com, right? We have Israel uh, and we're here always. And we're here thanks to you, really. So, you know, that is really my message. My message is this is this is one of the darkest times in our history. We're all suffering. You know, sometimes I can't get out of bed. You know, and the other day when we lost those soldiers, I unfortunately, because I have access to, to you know, to Intel information from different sources, I knew about it, you know, 20, 15 hours before it was released, and I couldn't sleep. I, I, I couldn't, I didn't even know what to do with myself. So, you know, I'm not pretending, you know, or implying that, oh, you know, we're going to win this and everything's great. No, it's it's hard. It's very, very hard, especially, you know, I'm not comparing myself to the soldiers on the front lines, but I'm on the front lines of the digital war and it's pretty bad. I'm in the mud all day long. I'm, in, you know, I'm in it, deep in it, and it's hard. Um, but, you know, it's clear to me that my mission is an important one. It's clear to me that people depend on me. And I and I think that, you know, if I'm just going to kind of leave you with one practical piece of advice, you know, there's a very common misconception that people say to me all the time, which is that, I, you know, I don't have a lot of followers. Well, what's the point of me posting on Facebook? I'm just talking to my echo chamber, right? Everyone's heard that, my echo chamber. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that that's not how social media works, because if you have two followers and you post something on your Facebook that's impactful, and it's written well, and it's meaningful, if one of those people shares it, you've just exited your echo chamber because now you access their followers. You have now, ex you've exited your, so, you know, I think each and every one of us has, you know, the ability and, you know, I think we really have the obligation in, in a way to not scroll our social media feeds like, like drug addicts, that's what we do. We can't do that. We each have to use, you know, our ability to impact and influence. And again, that's something that Ari taught me. There is no limit to how much impact a person can have. And so, you know, each in our own way, not, not saying that everyone needs to be on social media, but we all have to do something. And I know that, again, the organization, the FIDF, is doing unbelievable things. But as individuals, we also have to make sure to do our part, to speak up. And, you know, it's, it's rough when the entire world has lost their moral compass and there's and moral clarity is a, is a, you know, it's like, wow, that guy said the truth. It's like unbelievable. It's a novelty, you know? So we have, we have, again, I think we as, as a people and as a nation, um, you know, not only the Jewish nation, but people that, that still have moral clarity. It's our obligation to speak up. It's our obligation to show that not everyone has lost it and not everyone is spreading horrible propaganda and heart. There are amazing people in the pro-Israel camp. We're maybe not as loud as the people who are making a lot of noise, but we should be. We should be. And our message should be light. That is our, as far as I'm concerned, our narrative should not be the world hates us and should not be double standard and should not. Our message and our narrative for the world is the world is a very dark place. And that darkness manifests in our social media feeds. It is our job 
to extinguish that darkness with our light. And that is what we're doing. We're doing now. I hope and pray that we maintain the unity that we're seeing in the, the Jewish people today. It's a unity, as far as I'm concerned, that we haven't seen since Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, the Torah describes that we stood there with one man with one heart, unified, 600,000 men. And 600,000 men stood, 300,000 reservists and 300,000 in Washington, D.C., 600,000 people, unified. So as far as I'm concerned, this is Mount Sinai all over again. And so I'll just leave you with that, with those four words. They're the most important words, and you have to keep telling this to yourself. I have to keep telling it to myself on a daily, on an hourly basis. We will dance again. That's all I got. Hello, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that message of optimism, and thank you for communicating really with the Anglo world. You know, you, you're there, as you said. It's a very different front line than soldiers, but it's a front line, and we're, we're yeah. grateful to you. And thank you for engaging our participants and engaging those who uh, are watching you live and will be watching you on, on the email feed that they get this afternoon. We're very, very grateful. I appreciate the opportunity. And, I, you know, if I may, just one more sentence. I think, you know, like you presented it just now, people present to me all the time. There's the physical battlefield, the military battlefield, and the digital battlefield. I actually don't view it that way. I think that they are completely go hand in hand. So, again, for example, the hospital story. If we had not convinced the world that it wasn't us, the, the war would have been over that day. Right. We would have been isolated diplomat. We had so, you know, the 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 perception and you know public opinion isn't disconnected from the military operation. They go hand in hand. And, and it is our job, who are you know the people on the internet, to make sure that people know the truth and that people don't believe the propaganda. Because again, it seems to me that in our world, virtue of truth does not exist anymore. Truth is irrelevant. And it's our job to be the messenger of truth. We have to keep our moral clarity, it's hard because it seeps in. You hear the, 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 the propaganda, you start believing it. It's like, am I, am I crazy or is the whole world crazy, right? So we have to keep speaking up. We have to keep our moral clarity. Clarity, it's not easy, but, but it's an important, important mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, we're going to hand it over to Major General Nadav Padan, who, who's in Israel and who's been having a series of meetings, been working with the troops, with the commanders, and unfortunately, we've we've had a number of very significant events that have happened since we last got a briefing from Major General Nadav Padan on Sunday. Major General, please, please share with us your thoughts, your insights and analysis. So if I very briefly go from the north to the south and then focus on what happened the last uh, three days in Gaza Strip, I would say that nothing changed dramatically in, in at the north in Lebanon will was, was continue with this local friction uh, so far under the threshold of war that I would say that every day the IDF had another click to the kind of target that were uh, targeting inside uh, uh, Lebanon. Um, and the, the equations of, of Hezbollah uh, they've been put before the words uh, like uh, will kill his uh, soldier for every uh, terrorist that uh, the IDF will kill inside Lebanon or Syria uh, collapsed. So on one hand, Hezbollah uh, opened fire against Israel to support the war in, in uh, Gaza Strip. But at the other end, the deter and uh, a way calculate his move under the threshold of a uh, war very uh, um, puts a uh, limitation on, on the ability to achieve uh, goals. Um, we'll have to deal with it and make sure that we're pushing uh, the forces of Hezbollah north to the Litani River, north to five kilometers from, from the borders of Israel. Israel. So we will be able to convince our people to move back to their uh, villages and town around the, uh, along the, sea, the the border. But uh, from tactical point of view, so far the the achievement of the IDF are uh, bigger than the ability of Hezbollah to challenge us along the border. Um, uh, is is has been mentioned before. Continue with his uh, effort to uh, destroy infrastructure and buildings and houses along the border because he cannot, he didn't achieve to do anything else but destroying uh, buildings. When it comes to uh, Syria and Iraq, we're seeing the same kind of uh, effort 
thank God the U.S. over the last uh, 48 hours very active in attacking uh, Hezbollah inside the, uh, um, Iraq and respond in, in, with, with a lot of power against uh, the attack over the last uh, uh, 10 days against the uh, bases of, of, the, of the U.S. and, and Britain. Uh, when it comes to the south, to the Khurim, the war against the Khurim continued. Last night, there were a few waves of attack by Britain and, and the U.S. that succeeded to destroy um, uh, anti, uh, ground to, uh, uh, ground to air and ground to naval missiles, which is a uh, huge tactical success, but the friction and, and the problem along the Babel Manda and the gates to the Red Sea are continuing. When it comes to Gaza, uh, Major General Padan, can we ask you on that point? So you're saying that from a point of view qualitatively, the impact of the strikes that America and the UK have been doing on the Houthis is very significant. Do you think that anytime soon we'll see a return of cargo ships that have chosen not to go through the Straits of Yemen, Baba Mandab, the way that you know many of them are, are taking the very long route to get to their places? Do you think that that mainstream shipping will return or not in the short future? Not in the short future, but I, I totally believe that it will return. The global force will push the hooding to back to the place and, and the US tried to recruit China to push uh, Iran, to push the hooding uh, to withdraw from their idea to block Babel Manda, the gate to uh, uh, the Red Sea. So I, I believe that the, the global interest is to keep this path uh, open and because of that, it's not going to take long for the Iranian and for other to ask the Houthis to reduce their friction along this uh, part of the world. Uh, I truly believe that there is no other option. But uh, I mean, from a short-term perspective, they'll do whatever they can to echo their support to the to the Hamas, uh, and that's the only tool they have to. To deliver this, those ideas. So, from the, from short term perspective, I think that the friction will continue. Uh, from a middle and long range perspective, I'm, I'm definitely sure that this path will open uh, as soon as possible. Ceasefire in in Gaza Strip will, will be enough for them to to stop the friction there. Uh, when it comes to Gaza Strip, uh, I would say that the IDF more or less withdrawal from, from the north part of Gaza and the launching a uh, strike towards center of gravity every second day or so. Um, at the center of, of uh, in Gaza Strip, the, the operation against the, the refugee camp at the center of Gaza continue. And the main effort of uh, uh, the IDF right now is in Khan Yunus. The IDF start maneuvering to the west side of uh, Khan Yunus, to the refugee camp of Khan Yunus, which is a very crowded area with a lot of uh, terrorists. Over the last uh, uh, 40 hour, 48 hours, there is a lot of terrorists that have been killed there, and, and there is success of, of uh, this maneuver. They get to... Uh, center that produce uh, rockets and, and they found uh, storages of ammunition. So the maneuver uh, at the west side of uh, uh, Hanos is definitely a success. And there is an, a continuous effort to create kind of a buffer zone along the border between uh, Gaza Strip and Israel to create kind of a gray zone, a buffer zone of, of around 1K along the border. Uh, this operation include uh, creating kind of open space for, for our uh, uh, observation uh, uh, centers and destroy buildings that aim the border and from, uh, from them at the last uh, few years. There were a uh, sniper uh, shooting and, and rocket launching and, and others. Uh, this operation run by uh, the division of, of Gaza Strip that's responsible for the security routine of the uh, area. Unfortunately, uh, two days ago, during the 
uh, operation of, of reservists that uh, tried to destroy a building along the, this uh, buffer zone. The destruction done by explosion of, of uh, mines inside those uh, buildings, they, they prefer 10 buildings, uh, train of, of 10 buildings to be uh, exploited and, and uh, destroyed. And during the, the time that the soldiers are, are preparing those buildings, there were group uh, of terrorists that launched rocket, RPG rocket toward the one of the tanks that uh, secured uh, this operation and another rocket tower, the building that unfortunately initiated uh, the explosive device and two of those 10 buildings collapsed with the soldiers uh, inside them and the soldiers that surrounding them got injured. Unfortunately, in this event, we lost 21 reservists, which is the biggest, uh, the, the, darkest day since the beginning of, of uh, this operation. It's actually uh, equivalent to 10% of all the fallen soldiers from the beginning of the maneuver. It's it's terrible day. Uh, and add to those 21, we lost another three paratroopers during the maneuver in Hanunas. So we lost in the, sa the same day, 24 soldiers, three paratroopers, three officers from the paratrooper brigade and those 21 reserves. Terrible day. Now you mention all the people that uh, the soldier that got injured. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible uh, day. The, 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 the battalion, just, just, just a second, the battalion actually, the same battalion returned to those buildings and destroyed them uh, 24 hours later and the mission completed. But that was a terrible day. Sorry, what did you want to ask? There's a question that a number of the participants uh, asked that if we could ask you, and that is the following. Since in this area of Kanyunis, it's already been weeks that everyone has been told to evacuate. You know, the, there should be no one in that area. People have been told to evacuate. The question that is asked is the following. Why wouldn't we eliminate those buildings from the air as opposed to putting our soldiers at risk? having them do the work being on the ground. And again, we don't know the facts, but that's the question that's coming. If you could try to address that. Uh, first of all, there is many reasons. Uh, we are there. The whole area is surrounding with soldiers. So if you want to attack it from the air, you have to actually evacuate the place. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that there is a, a, a kind of effort to save the ammunition of the Air Force for the a, next month, the next day of, of the maneuver in Gaza Strip, or if we'll need them at the north. Third, and most importantly, you achieve better result when you actually uh, destroy the building from the ground. You can make sure that the, all the infrastructure, all the, the tunnels, all the uh, shuffles are, are, are destroyed as you want it to be destroyed. And um, there is another option, by the way, to destroy those buildings with uh, buggers and, and, and uh, denies. Uh, this, the... What are they? The, the question uh, uh, in most cases said uh, that if the building is, is three stairs or more, you cannot destroy it with denials. Or the result uh, are not going to be as, as you want it to be. So the best way is to, to use ammunition. The only thing is that, and, and we destroy hundreds of buildings like that in this buffer zone. The only issue is that you have, you have to make sure that you uh, uh, plans box of security, what we call kind of a 500 meters surrounding the, the operation area that will be secure from terrorists to get close to this uh, place. That's the only thing. And unfortunately, this uh, group of three terrorists been uh, able to sneak through those uh, forces that create this box and, and uh, launch two rockets to our, our soldier. That's that's mistake that we have to, the idea have to check. 
but definitely there is better result when you destroy the, the building from the ground and uh, denies after the explosion of, of this uh, building are cleaning them and make sure that the site of those uh, uh, posts along the uh, border will see the whole area. I mean, you see they, they will have like site of, of at least 1K at the center of uh, Gaza Strip and all over, all along the border. Um, the the um, um, second question about the evacuation of uh, uh, citizens or civilian that got the wrong name uninvolved, that a lot of them are involved from, from uh, Khan Yunus. The problem is that we're fighting against Hamas that using those people as, as human shield and they are blocking them from, from leaving uh, Khan Yunus to the south. Over the, the last few days, Thank God Hamas are, are hiding and are not being able to block all the effort of the, of the citizen to go to the south and, and thousands of them are moving to the south and evacuate the, the west side of, of uh, uh, Khan Yunus and, and uh, the refugee camp of Khan Yunus. And that will provide the IDF ability to maneuver easily in those uh, uh, areas. The only thing that block limited our ability to operate to use our forces our power is the the existence of, of civilian and uh, the effort of uh, the idf to avoid as much as can from uh, uh, collateral damages um i'm not so sure uh, who is still in 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 Hanunes and who ran to the south the only place right now in gaza strip that stay for terrorists if you will is, is the area of uh, Rafiah, and the IDF started meeting uh, leaders in Rafiah from um, uh, from the air and, and by uh, using uh, special forces. Uh, I don't know if it's been published yet or not, but there was three attack over the last uh, 24 hours of special forces uh, in strike against uh, leader of Hamas in in, in Rafiah. So if you will, if I taking if I'm taking one step backward and look uh, from birds a few of what happened in Gaza Strip, we withdraw from the north part and we're striking uh, uh, the center of gravity is inside the north. We're launching maneuver at the center and, and the north south in Hanunes and we're launching special operation at the south part of Rafiah right now. That's that's the way the IDF maneuver inside uh, Gaza. We start uh, releasing reservists and moving soldier and forces to the north, getting ready to welcome uh, change the situation at the north part of the uh, border. So uh, not waiting for uh, uh, finish all our goals and achieving all our goals and all our missions in Gaza, in Gaza Strip before uh, getting ready to um, uh, move forward at the north. And when we take risk of our strike at the north, you always have to keep in mind that those uh, strikes could lead us to, uh, to extend the operation and even get to a full scale war in, in, at the north. So that's definitely will need more forces at, at the northern command and that's what the idf was doing parallel to what you see in here at the at the south in gaza strip that's more or less conclude the wrap up the situation right now uh, in the war and if there is any questions steve yeah one question i wanted to ask you and this goes back to a question that we we ran out of time last time you took a number of american and british generals uh, when the war was going on in the northern Gaza and Gaza City. Could you share with us, you know, whatever you're allowed to share with us, the, the experience and, and their opinions, observations, uh, seeing the Israeli troops working in probably the most densely populated situation in, in the history of, of warfare? So the old group that I've been with three times, are part of uh, of uh, were part or their nation were part of the coalition that fought in in Iraq, and some of them in Afghanistan. 
They have experiences in fighting terror and guerrilla. They have experience in, in fighting inside urban area. And they all were shocked from the a kind of facility, stop terrain system, amount of ammunition, amounts of rocket, and so far and so on that were facing in Gaza Strip. So if they compare it to what the coalition faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, they definitely could say from professional perspective that this area is a lot more complicated, a lot more crowded when it comes to uh, terror and terror facilities, and a lot more, I would say, developed or sophisticated than, than the enemies and the challenges that the coalition faced in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, they were shocked from another thing. They met commanders and had brief from, from uh, brigade commanders. So they were in shock from the, the way the IDF treat the people of Gaza and the way that the idea for the, the method the IDF used to avoid collateral damage. They, they, not all of them, but some of them told us that we are insane, that the risk that we are taking uh is is not professional and, and if it was the us or great britain they will bomb the whole area without the uh, uh, any doubt um israel working under another level of inspection i would say and we have to be uh more standard than the pop himself um, and Thank God, the professionality and the skills that we developed over the years allowed us to achieve our mission without being judged for being uh, for losing our value. And I must tell you another thing: it's not only because we have the uh, international inspection; we have our own inspection. We're fighting to to make sure and and defend our citizens, to defend the borders of Israel, but also to defend our values. Uh, and you have to remember when it comes to Israel, it's not war over the ocean that nobody listened to it and nobody cared. It's the whole community of Israel that involved deeply in every decision, in every event inside Gaza Strip and to deliver uh, the way that we are uh, judging ourselves and the value that we are using during the maneuvering Gaza Strip to attain the, the people of Israel and give us the inside Israel, the ability to fight and feel that we are doing the right thing from every perspective you can look at it. So it's not for, for the international community to judge us, it's for us to be able to look at ourselves bravely, truly, and, and understand 100% that we are doing every effort on earth to keep our values. Ladies and gentlemen, that says it all. This is the, this is the army. These are the, the men and women that we are supporting, and that we're doing everything we can to provide for them in terms of their most critical, urgent needs. It's the most moral and ethical army on earth. And it's one thing to say those words, but you just heard from Major General Padan, you know, in the eyes and in the mouths of the leadership of two of the most ethical, moral armies that have ever existed in history the Army of the United States of America and the Army of, the, of Britain, of the United Kingdom. That is what they shared with Major General Padan when he took them through the battles in Gaza City, in Northern Gaza, and in other parts. And I think that's something that, that every one of us, you know, it's what Hillel does, what, what Hillel's been doing on, on, a base, on an hourly level. That story is the story that Major General Padan is sharing with us factually firsthand and it's something to be said that we shouldn't take, we shouldn't take advantage, that we shouldn't take for granted. Uh, Major General Padan, thank you very much. I look forward to joining you for the next briefing in Israel. We'll be briefing everyone on Sunday. Unless there is a, a, a radical change in anything, please be prepared. We'll have our next briefing Sunday at noon Eastern time, nine Pacific, 11 Central, and wanna wish the soldiers of Israel, the people of Israel, we want to wish them security, safety, and God should look after them. And to each and every one of you who are supporting them, 
we're incredibly grateful. Thank you.